this week on the Deep Leadership Podcast. I see the same thing in organizations. Um, the, the beautiful thing about full contact training is you just learn a lot about yourself. Mm. And you also learn about how to deal with other people who are not holding back. It is great to meet you, and I'm excited to talk about this. Collaboration is something very important to leadership, and in 300 episodes, we haven't talked about it. So I'm, I'm excited to have an expert on board to, to talk about it. So get us started. In general, what is collaboration? Well, for me, it's really pretty simple. It's getting important things done with other people. Like At its most basic, that's all it is. We, we do it all the time, and most of the time, it goes pretty well except when it doesn't. And that's usually when either we're uh, dealing with complex challenges or tough problems, whether they're tough people problems or tough situational problems. And that's where we usually encounter challenges. So uh, that's really what my work is about and what this book is about is how do we uh, learn how to deal with those challenges, those challenging collaborative situations in new ways. That's exciting. I mean, um, you know, I, th I think about all the times that uh, in the different companies I work for, where, like you said, it's working with other people to get things done, right? That where it goes wrong. <laughs> and it, it seems like more than more than often it went wrong. So give us a flavor when when an organizational collaboration goes right, what's it like versus when it goes wrong? Yeah. Well, when it goes right, we, we've all experienced this. Uh, it feels like people have a, a shared view of what they're doing together. Their expectations are well aligned with what's actually showing up in each other, in each other's behaviors. And uh, good stuff happens. Results get produced that we're hoping for or better. And generally the tone of the conversations feel pretty uh pretty even if not kind of buoyant things feel pretty easy like we're in a, in some kind of a flow together and mm. you know when it's not of course things feel jammed up we get uptight we get anxious angry we can go into all sorts of, of places around blame and accusation and feeling like victims or feeling righteous, all of that stuff happens with, with pretty much all of us when mm. we're pushed far enough. And uh, good stuff isn't happening. And sometimes we're just not sure why. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. I mean, you know, I think about projects I've been on in the past where, boy, it, like you said, it's a flow state. Like everything is just, you know, like I would tell you on a submarine, right? So when, when you know, our team when you know we'd been operating so long together it, i knew what everybody was going to do before they did it like we mm -hmm. were a well-oiled machine we had practiced it so many times that we never missed every time we go to the, the the range and we shoot torpedoes we never missed because we were just a finely uh, uh finely oiled machine and i've been on other teams where we're tripping over each other people are getting angry people are getting upset and it's it's amazing and it's just it's the same it's it's a group of people and but we couldn't get along. We couldn't get things done. Mm -hmm. We were always in conflict. And so I've been in both of it. So I know what it feels like when it works. And it's so frustrating when it doesn't work, right? Yeah, and, and I yeah. think we all experience that sometime in our careers. Yeah, you know, I I liked what you said. You said we practice together so much. Now let's just take that concept for a moment. Now think about organizational life. How many teams would actually say, we have practiced collaborating together so much that we just never miss? No, you, never, you would never hear that. <laughs> you just wouldn't hear it. I've never heard that. Yeah, you're right. And yeah. There are a couple of reasons for it, I think. One is that the notion of practice, we generally don't apply to things like collaborating and communicating, to listening, to helping each other think together in new ways, to inviting dissenting views and working through complex problems together to learn together. So we don't associate practice with those types of activities. 
And then the other thing is we don't actually take the time. And of course they're related. We don't take the time to practice working together. Well, mm. we work together. We try, we do our, everyone's doing their best, smart people, creative people, committed people get together. They do their best. Sometimes it works great. Sometimes it doesn't. And when it doesn't, folks don't always have a very clear sense of why that is. And therefore what to do differently. How can you practice if you're not really sure what you should be practicing, even if you you do have the notion that we should be practicing something, but what? Yeah. What does that actually look like in an organization? Yeah, I love that you said that, you know, sometimes when it goes wrong, you don't know why. And I would say that that's a characteristic of all the teams I was on that didn't go well. Hard to tell why, you know, yeah. and you could you can make a list of what you think is the reason. But part of it is, like you said, we're not we weren't rehearsed. We weren't practiced. We it, it was an unnatural situation. We just everybody was maybe in, in it for themselves uh, and our agendas were not aligned and, you know, and, and it was failure as a result. And it, it happens way too many times. So that's yeah. why this is such an important conversation. So I wanted to switch a little bit to um, you. You talk about uh, collaborative leadership in this uh, as this term full contact performance. Now, uh, that same, seems interesting to me. So explain this distinction uh, in how you uh, explain collaborative leadership. Yeah. Well, it uh, I, I took the name from the martial arts. And uh, in martial arts, there are different ways of training together, different ways of learning and, and, and uh, working on your skills. And, uh, you know, one way in certain martial arts really focus much more on this, uh, on a type of practice called full contact, full contact sparring, where you don't hold back. You usually are wearing some kind of protective gear and you go at it and you, because that's how you learn what you're actually good at, what you need to keep working on. Uh, the pressure is on and you can still get hurt, even if you're wearing protective gear, of course. You're not trying to hurt each other. You're trying to really land your strikes and punches, however, and because you have to know how to do that. And if you're always holding back and and going, you know, half speed or half effort, you'll never really know what it is to go full out. And you won't know how to deal with somebody who is going full out. So I see the same thing in organizations. Um, the, the beautiful thing about full contact training is you just learn a lot about yourself. Mm. And you also learn about how to deal with other people who are not holding back. In organizations, it's kind of similar. You can uh, sit in on a group and see how people often hold themselves back for all sorts of reasons. They don't want to embarrass each other. They don't want to embarrass themselves. They don't want to say something that makes them seem stupid. They don't want to say something that could provoke conflict or confrontation. People will freeze up. They'll get uptight. They'll get angry. And generally, people aren't good at dealing with those situations. So we tend to avoid them. Mm -hmm. And what that uh, turns into is uh, a lot of meetings and conversations where people are, many people are holding back. Now, not everybody. There's usually some people in a group who will go all out. And even some groups where I'll, I'll work, start working with an executive team, for instance. And, you know, when I first uh, meet with them, I'll hear things like, well, we, we are a team. We don't hold back. We just, we're straight shooters. We say what's on our mind. And you'd think that that's full contact, but it isn't always full contact. It's just full impulsivity very often. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would rather see a team that doesn't hold back, but also knows how to reflect on what they're doing and how they're doing it together than just a team that goes all out telling everybody what it, how, what's going on with them and talking straight where there's no reflection because mm -hmm. those are pretty weak teams. There's often a lot of fear. There's a lot of aggression and they mistake straight talk for effective talk for effective conversations. They're not the same thing. I think for, um, for full contact to be meaningful, 
we have to be reflecting on what we're doing, both while we're doing it, which is harder to do, of course, but certainly after, you know, at the end of a conversation, well, how did we do? How did, how did we actually, we were just doing a conversation together. How did that go? From your perspective, how, here's how it went from my perspective. What do we think we could have done differently? This goes back to the practice theme. We were not used to doing that because we don't really see conversations as a domain of skill that can be reflected on together and worked on and improved and transformed actually. So full contact in an organization is where people know how to really share their views, their ideas, their uh, world perspectives, to disagree with each other, to challenge each other's thinking, and to do it in a way that allows people to learn, to keep learning together, rather than to get stuck and uh, frozen in discomfort or fear or embarrassment. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, if I if I think back, you know, in some of the some of the research I read on team formation, right. And, um, you know, one of the things they talk about is there's two different kinds of conflict that occur in, in team formation. One is task conflict. This is a team that's doing well, and they, they have conflict on the best way to move forward, right? But they're working in a collaborative way to solve it, right? And so that conflict is actually necessary to build trust because you're having a back and forth and you're willing to be you're willing to be vulnerable with your ideas and you don't get shot down because of a team that's working together. So task conflict is considered to be a good thing in team formation. Uh, but um, but personal conflict, right? And um, is considered when you have a personal conflict with each other and you are, you know, and so you have one individual that's maybe uh, taking over for the team and trying to, trying to bully other people, uh, trying to get their way. Uh, it's focused on personal agenda versus the team agenda. That's a terrible thing for a team, right? So there's, so there's the conflict is not necessarily a bad thing, right? It's actually can be a good thing, but you have to get to the point where the team has built some level of trust and collaboration where they can, you know, work on tasks and have that conflict yeah. and disagree on other, on the best, and, and to, to look, disagree to the point where they're looking for the best solution, not disagree to the point where they're pointing fingers and blame and, 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 and it's complete dysfunction. So, so conflict yeah. itself is not bad. It's just, how is that conflict in, in uh, manifesting itself? Yeah. How are we relating to that? I really like that distinction you made and um, between the, the different types of conflict. I think that the really high performing teams excel at conflict in the mm -hmm. sense that they excel at, uh, at encouraging and really engaging with dissent and divergent thinking and divergent ideas and opinions. And rather than that being a weakness, it becomes their strength because they know how to work with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that's I see not that. easy to do. You know, it, yeah. it, that that often takes some work and practice together. Yeah, I mean, you know, to be honest, you, you'd think like on a submarine, everybody was pretty chill, but we were we were pretty intense individuals, and but we trusted deeply, trusted each other. But if mm. if they you get called out though, if you if someone did something wrong or they, uh, so we were willing to have a little, you know, have those battles. Uh, but we we implicitly trusted each other, but we were willing to you know, to battle for the right idea to make sure that we're always, always the mission came first. And so mm -hmm. it, we, 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 we did fight, but it was meant to be towards that mission. And, uh, and it was never personal. It was always like, you know, I know, I think we should dive deep. We should do this. And like, but, but, but if we do that, this is going to happen. And you're like, oh, you're, you're mm -hmm. right. Let's go with your idea. So there was always, it was it, sometimes very intense, but we loved each other, trusted each other, and it was always mission, trying to get the mission accomplished. So I think I think that's a great example of where you say conflict isn't necessarily a bad thing. And, and even emotional conflict is not necessarily a bad thing in, in a situation like that. Yeah, you're describing, um, that, that sounds like a full contact. It was full contact, 100%. Full contact. When you mentioned that, talking about take, you know, full, you know, not holding back punches, that's yeah. the way we were. We were we were not holding back our punches because it was very it was life or death decision making, yeah. right? So it was definitely um, you know, full contact. But again, it was mission first. Well, how can we accomplish the mission? Everybody was on board for the mission. And I think that's and the mission was that's clear. The, different. the mission, the mission was very clear. Yeah, yeah. that's a, that's another thing. We talk it about a lot. Important. When you get to corporate, I know for me at least, after leaving the military, going to the corporate, 
that was a biggest challenge for me is like, I didn't know what the mission was. I, mm. What was the mission? Was it to make good quality? Was it to make a profit? Was it to grow our mm. sales? I didn't really know what it, what it was, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think we get mixed messages when you come into a company, like, what is the mission? I'm not really sure, you know? Yeah, yeah. really common. Yeah. And, and often quite hard to pin down. Mm. You'd yeah. think it would, you'd think it'd be more straightforward, but it often, it's not. And people aren't even aware that it's not. We we often use kind of vague language, generalities, thinking that we're being specific, but we're not. Yeah. And it has big ramifications for people be precisely because they're not really sure what they're all lined up to, mm. as you were, you guys were on that submarine. But yeah. it, as you said, it's it's just not always the case in the, yeah. out the rest of the world. Yep. You you talk about uh, this uh, this idea of collaborative leadership as an internal art. Explain yeah. that. I I think when I heard when I read that I was thinking like martial arts, but maybe I'm reading that wrong. But what do you mean by an internal art? I'll I'll tell you how I came to that notion. Uh, I done a lot of workshops all around the world in in different companies and and cultures. And part of the workshop, we have we ask uh, leaders to think of a challenging organizational problem that they're dealing with, or maybe that they have dealt with or that they expect to deal with soon, and then to design a conversation. Imagine they could talk with anybody in the organization and have that conversation actually design right out how they would begin the conversation, what their conversational strategy would be. And then what, how the other person would respond and then a back and forth. It sort of take a couple of pages to really design the perfect conversation that would address this problem. We do that, then we look at them carefully. And we, we really examine all of these conversations. And then we say, well, first of all, how do you all think this would have gone? And when they stop to think about it, they realize many of these conversations that they had time to think through and design wouldn't actually produce the desired results. Mm -hmm. That got my attention. The other thing that got my attention is when we look closely at the moves that these leaders would make in these conversations, the things they'd said, compared to what they were actually thinking and feeling, there was often a big discrepancy, a big gap. And these are the same people who before this exercise have listed all of the things that go that you need for good collaboration, trust, honesty, respect for differences, good listening, understanding, and so forth. And yet in these exercises, when they really look closely, they see that they were violating many of mm -hmm. these tenets that are shared around the world. Everybody has a pretty similar list. So that I, I realized at that point that people know what works. So something else is going on. It's not that we don't know what works. It's that we're not actually aware of what we're doing when we're under pressure in these difficult situations. Mm, and okay. we default to patterns that we've learned, things we, things we say and ways that we manage ourselves that we think are effective. But then by these executives' own reckoning later on after the exercise, they, they say, wow, I had no idea. I thought I was doing all the right things and it was these other people that were messing it up and making things difficult. And so they thought they were doing things they weren't doing and they weren't doing things they thought they were doing. That was a, that was a big light bulb for me. And I realized the problem is not that people don't know. There are a lot of books, workshops, all sorts of resources out there. The problem is, they're not aware of what they're doing. And this applies to all of us. I'm not excluding myself too. When I'm under pressure, I know I'm going to default to some less than productive moves at times, hopefully less than I used to. Yeah. But, but you know, this is what we do. We're not aware of what we're actually doing in real time. So until we start to gain more awareness, i.e. practice together to see, oh, I see what I just said actually could very easily trigger this person who I care about and know and respect, but trigger them into defensiveness or uh, 
feeling like I'm not trusting them or I'm challenging who they are as a person and so forth. And we all are doing this. It's like a big billiard game where we're all making these moves. We're not really aware we're making them, but things are going sideways and no one's quite sure why or what to do about it. So for me, uh, gaining awareness of what we are doing, and that's the internal art. When I, I start to get a better handle on how I'm using my words, mm. on where I'm placing my attention in a conversation, that's another big thing is we have different ways of using our attention, which I learned in martial arts. And the way we're using our attention in a conversation can make a huge difference, just like it does on the Aikido mat. The other thing is that we have bodies. Mm. And we forget we have bodies. We, <laughs> we're, we're just walking brains and everything, uh, it's everything, a thought is everything. You know, what we think and say is all is the end of the story, but it's not. We're emotional beings. We have bodies, we have nervous systems. And we can use the, the nervous system and our attention to gain more awareness of how we're feeling, what we're thinking, how we're impacting other people, how other people are impacting us. And that is actually transformative. When we start to gain real-time awareness of what's going on with us, with me, I'm going to be much more effective at working with you. And the beauty there is that I don't have to expend so much effort trying to change you, which is a fool's errand anyway. Right. right. I can't do that, nor, nor can you change me if I don't want to be changed. And very, you know, most of us, we don't want our colleagues to be running around trying to change us all the time. Who wants right. that? Right. And yet that's how we spend a lot of our time in organizations, running around trying to convince and persuade and influence people without starting where we really need to be starting, which is I need to change myself, my way of being, my way of thinking, my way of speaking, my way of listening. And then really interesting things start to happen. When I start to shift my way of being, uh, other people around me start to change too. They start to seem more receptive. If I'm more receptive, I start listening better. Other people tend to start listening better to me too. And this is because they also have a nervous system. And our nervous systems are really finely attuned to one another. So we're always reciprocating and kind of um, entraining ourselves with the people around us. And when we start to realize that, we we gain a, a whole new handle on how to actually work with people. Wow, and it's this, not, it's yeah, not where we usually focus. No, not at all. In fact, you're hitting on so many different things. I mean, you know, I, 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 you know, I sense a little bit of emotional intelligence there, right? Knowing your own emotions, knowing the emotions of being able to read the emotions of others. I hear uh, nonverbal communication, which is a big part of what we, what we have to be aware of as leaders. Um, there, there's just so. Oh, the, the other thing is too is that you know setting the tone, like because we tend to be reflective on other people's emotions, and so our especially as a leader, we set the tone for the organization. If we take a uh, you know a more you know listening tone, a more understanding tone, a more considering tone then we notice everyone else's as well too but if we're running around screaming and yelling we gotta get this done it's, it's due tomorrow everyone else is running around panicked as well too so all these things are 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 tied into it. i like the idea of that you mentioned attention and and the body and not forgetting those two important elements too and uh, i think that's something that we you're right i think we we think of ourselves as is uh as floating brains i think a lot and not only that for floating brains that whatever our thoughts in we believe that the other person understood it 100% the way we thought of it in our brain <laughs> regardless of how true, we John? said it with our yeah. body language or our voice and so that's another thing too is the sender and the receiver right of any message is going to be just there's going to be distortion there as well what you meant and what they understood is always there's always a gap there. So uh, inescapable. So much yeah. To this. Yeah. 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 So much to this that, that, that I really think you're right. It is a, it is an internal art. <laughs> it is an art to this, uh, to be, to be good at it and to, um, and to recognize what's really happening in the moment too, versus yeah. just reacting. And like you said, when we're under stress, we're just, we just, we're just reacting 
to what's happening around us and we're not really thinking through what's happening but um yeah that's 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 such a powerful uh, idea and concept because I think you're right. There's a lot of things that are happening uh, when we're trying to work with other people, for sure. Even you know, I was thinking too, even with our spouses, even with our children, even with our our uh, our neighbor, right? You know, these are the similar things, right? <laughs> we're in conflict. It's all the neighbor. same. Yeah, it is it all is the same, same, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. Yeah. So yeah. You talked about in the book, you talk about three conversations mm -hmm. of organizational collaboration. Um, could you tell us a little bit about those three conversations and, and why they're so important? Yeah, to get things done with people, we have to solve problems. We have to make commitments to one another so we can we can get more done than any of us can do by ourselves. Uh, but to know how to commit ourselves and to know what are meaningful goals and how to make good decisions, we first have to learn together. We have to know what is, what is going on here. Uh, and we have to be able to overcome the blindness that we each bring to the table. And it's inescapable. It's not a shortcoming uh, of any one person. It's a generic shortcoming that we all have. We are all blind more than we, we see. And in today's world, there is so much more information out there that it, it's much harder to really navigate than it used to be. I mean, in, in you know, 100, 150 years ago, maybe you didn't need to know quite as much. There wasn't as much to know about what was going on in the marketplace and the environment and technology and so forth. There were different challenges back then, but today um, we all have our individual blind spots, but more importantly, we all are very limited in what we can know. So it's really shifted the need to be able to learn together effectively. That's a critical leadership skill. And uh, that's a particular kind of conversation. I call it the learning conversation. It's where we learn how to uh, relate to information effectively, to listen well, to raise and encourage dissenting views, to compare dissenting views, a lot, a lot of opportunity for constructive conflict that we were talking about earlier. And if we're able to learn well together, the output of that is that we are changed as a result of the conversation. If everyone left the conversation coming out the same that they went in, that would have been a failed conversation. And that's the kind of conversations that a lot of people have. And that's why they hate meetings a lot. And it's one mm -hmm. of the reasons yeah. they hate meetings is because nothing happens. Nobody seems to really come out differently. And uh, so the goal of a learning conversation is that we come out knowing more and, and thinking better than we did before. And when that happens, we are able to make better decisions. And that takes us to the design conversation. And the design conversation is where we make decisions, where we set goals, we decide, determine strategies, and, and decide what's important to measure and how are we going to measure it, do all of that stuff that you know leaders know about. And uh, but when decisions don't go well or goals aren't very effectively established or strategies aren't well matched to the task, it's often because folks didn't learn well or don't know how to learn when they're when they encounter these these obstacles and they see things are not going well, then you have to have a learning conversation to figure out what's going on. Mm. So you have a learning conversation that leads to a good design conversation. And from there, it's time to move into where everybody wants to get to, which is to the action, to execution. And um, I call this the fulfillment conversation. And the reason I call it that is because execution, as I see it, is all about making commitments to one another. In other words, we make promises to one another. I'm going to do this for you, John. You're going to be my customer for this, and I'm going to do this by time, by this time. And uh, I want, I need to make sure that the promises I make to you actually satisfy you at the end of the day. 
And then in the very next conversation, you might be making a promise to me, regardless of hierarchy. We make promises are made regardless of hierarchy throughout organizations all the time. Mm -hmm. And there's an art to making and managing good promises. And the reason I call it the fulfillment conversation is because execution happens and accountability happens when we fulfill promises that we've made to other people inside the company, outside the company. And when uh, the people who have made promises to us do the same. So uh, these three conversations, you know, in the abstract, they go from learning to design to fulfillment. In, in reality, we're cycling through all of these three conversations all of the time. And uh, we just need to understand how to have these conversations go well. And when we do, it's uh, and we when we recognize and identify these conversations, oh, you know, I think we need I think I don't think we're doing a very good job learning here, John. Let's focus on comparing mm -hmm. what we're both seeing in the data because we're looking at the same things, but we're kind of operating on different interpretations. So let's share our interpretations and see what we think. And that'll probably lead to some new decisions and to new promises. So it's an interplay between these conversations. And of course, our attention and our bodies are always present in these conversations along with our words. Yeah, it, 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 you know, again, I go back to thinking about my days on the submarine. I can, I can identify each one of these three conversations that we, we had, you know, mm. in terms of a lot of times we would drill in practice and it was this learning you know, we would, we would debrief like after something or like, okay, what happened? You know, we, we completely missed, you know, we did something wrong. So was, we were having that learning conversation. Then, you know, we would, we were practicing enough where we knew each other. Then we would have an event, like we we're pulling into a, uh, to, to a place we've never, you know, coming into an inlet, we've never been there before. So we're going to get together where that's a design conversation. All right. We're going to someplace mm. new. We've never done it before. What's what are the concerns? What are the challenges? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Right. And then, and then it's like, mm. okay, hey, you know, we're, we're going to, we're going to, you know, put the maneuvering watch at 8 AM and it, now it's action time. And now we're all, we've got headphones on, we're talking to each other. We've already had the design conversation. We've already mm. had a learning conversation. We already know, what everybody's role is in in this and so now we're executing like a fine you know like a like a fine oil machine at this point because we've had those conversations so i can really relate to this but when i think about my days in corporate 22 years i can't remember any time <laughs> where i where <laughs> those things were working well <laughs> so uh. so what i'm what i sense is that uh, this book is very important <laughs> what i sense is what you're talking about is critical for, for businesses and organizations, if you want to be effective in terms of collaboration and getting things done, for sure. Absolutely. Makes a lot of sense. You know, I, I love that example you gave. I, I, I want to have more conversations with you. I, I have a, a <laughs> sense that you have a lot of, of really great stories and examples that could bring this, this way of thinking to life because you lived that and, uh, yeah. Really yeah, cool again, stuff. it's easy for me to relate because I've actually been on a team that collaborated really well. So it's like, oh yeah, this is what we did, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's neat to hear that what you have presented, I've lived it, you know? And so it's, it, it makes so much sense. So uh, this is fantastic, Grayson. Um, what final message would you like to leave with our listeners? Mm, final message. <laughs> when your next find yourself at an impasse, having a tough conversation or project is just stuck and you're not sure where to go, hit the pause button, take a break and see if you can shift focus for even just 30 seconds to yourself. What's going on in your body? What, what stories are you telling yourself about the situation, about the other people, about yourself? Just take a break, disengage long enough to check in with yourself, take a breath or two and see if uh, that may open up some new opportunities. Powerful Because that's where the action is. The action is in here. It's not out there where we usually think it is. Absolutely. Like you said, we spend our lifetime trying to change people. <laughs> We're the only person we really can affect is right here. So yeah. it's our, ourselves. 
and take take you know what can you do to yourself to to make a bigger impact on others and i think that's that's really the question and uh that's such a such a great thing to think about the book is called full contact performance it's all about collaboration um so grayson how can people find out more about you and this new book oh the book is available anywhere online amazon barnes and noble your local bookseller and uh I'd love to hear from folks. They can reach me at uh, fullcontactinstitute.com. And my email is grayson at fullcontactinstitute.com. Well, perfect. We're going to put links in the show notes for all of Grayson's resources. And again, listeners, if you're listening in and you're saying, wow, I have, this, this has really resonated with me. I've got real collaboration issues in my organization. I really need to think through what Grayson's talk about, I, talking about. I got to think through these three conversations. I got to think through uh, attention, our, my body, uh, all these things that we talked about. I highly recommend you reach out to Grayson, get an expert, talk to someone that has been thinking through this uh, and can help you resolve the issues that you're that you're struggling with. And again, I highly recommend pick up this book, Full Contact Performance, if you want to understand collaboration in a deeper way. Grayson, I want to thank you for coming on the show and sharing this important topic and all of uh, your knowledge around it. John, I really enjoyed it. Great talking with you. Thank you. Uh, I enjoyed it as well. Thank you. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well.